Hey guys, my name is John and I was a full-time pastor for about 10 years and I recently came out of that. Today, I want to share with you a little bit about my journey and some things that are close to my heart. Some of us need to recognize this, that you have not been ended just yet. God is not done with as you As long as you have breath in your body and energy in your bones, let me tell you, God has stormed will that pass. we will stand it will pass. firm come hell or high water. So where did my story in ministry or uh, in Christianity begin? Um, you know, when I was a kid, I always had this sense that there was something bigger out there, uh, more. Uh, I didn't really know who God was or what religion was about, but uh, I had this impression that, you know, there was just more to life than what we know and what we see. And I remember going to a youth group when I was like uh, 15 to 16 years old, and it was uh, honestly quite an interesting experience for someone who has had no background in church. You know, the lights were dark and like there was free food. Uh, there was like lots of people. They were like girls who would actually be willing to talk to you. There was music and all that kind of stuff. I don't really remember what happened exactly, but all I remember was a guy talking passionately on stage. And then after that, a friend was a friend of mine was saying, do you want to go down to the front? I was like, sure, what does that mean? No idea. After the service, they told me, hey, you've just become a Christian. And I was like, okay, cool. Like. How does that work? That was one of my earliest memories in church. But I'll tell you the defining moment for me was when I was 16 years old. Um, it wasn't in church. I was on a family holiday in New Zealand. So we were in this place called Kaikura. And I don't know whether you've been there. It's a beautiful place. You've got snow-capped mountains in the background and you've got a beach that you can walk along while enjoying particular sit background. It was really almost something out of a postcard, They're like amazing. And I remember I was just there on my own, walking on the beach, you know, chilling, just doing my own thing, being a bit bored. But as I was walking on the beach, I heard someone call my name. When somebody calls your name, the natural thing for you to do is you turn around to see who's that, right? I turned around and there was nobody there. And it was at that exact moment, I somehow understood that God was speaking to me. I was going to church for about a year then, but I had no theology or understanding of what it means to hear from God. Nobody told me that these things could happen. Nobody taught me that you could have an experience like this. It was just a divine moment that I had with God. I remember as I turned around, this overwhelming sensation of I don't know what it was, tingling, love, joy, peace, whatever, all those cliche things they say. I just felt it from the top of my head to the tip of my toes and I just felt so overwhelmed. And the voice continued and it spoke to me and said, I'm going to use you for my purposes. That was where my ministry or pastoral journey kind of began. Now you must understand, I said that I had no idea of what this means. So I went back home to tell my leaders, I said, this happened to me, what does this mean? And they said, well, maybe you're supposed to be a pastor. And I'm like, okay, you know, so I was about 16 at the time. I was going to finish high school at 17 years old. So I thought, okay, that's my future there. Said after high school, I'm going to go straight to Bible college and I'm going to become a pastor. But along the way, stuff happened in the church that I was attending and I kind of like stopped following God for a while. And I went to Australia. Before that, I was attending church. You know, I was going to youth services, but I wasn't really discipled. But it was only in Australia when I joined a, a church there that I really got the guidance that I needed, the guidance of leaders and pastors as well. It wasn't just going to programs where fun and all that kind of stuff. I felt like I was going through a um, rebirth, you know, or proper discipleship track. As I was going through that phase of my life. I was reminded of the encounter I had in New Zealand. More and more as I grew closer to God, God just kept bringing me back to that memory. I could not shake it off. I remember going to a conference in 2007. That feeling of not being able to run from that original call or that memory that I had became so strong to the point that I just cried out to God. I said, God, what is it that you want me to do? And 
I felt like the Lord said to me that He wanted me to stop my engineering degree and to go to Bible college. Now you must understand from where I come from, you are either a doctor, lawyer, engineer or an accountant. If you can't be this four, then maybe you should be a teacher. If you can't even hack it as a teacher, you then become a pastor. So that's kind of like how the social hierarchy goes with where, where I'm from. And I was like explaining to the Holy Spirit, I said, God, you know that I'm here in Australia. My parents have paid a whole bunch of money for me to do engineering for about a year then. How is this going to happen for me? But I, I prayed and I trusted God. I said, God, if this is your will, you will open the doors for me. My dad wasn't a Christian at, at that point of time, but long story short, God opened all sorts of doors for me and I went to Bible college and never looked back since then. So that was like 2008. In 2011, I've always had the thought that, you know, I'm going to be serving God in Australia, pastor there, all's going to be well. But God spoke to me and gave me this impression that, hey, the same God that moves in Australia and overseas is the same God that can move in Malaysia. And I was convicted by that. With that, I decided to take a leap of faith come back to Malaysia to become a pastor. I had all these ideas or thoughts of what a successful ministry should be like. I was part of big churches my whole Christian journey. I went for big conferences, big camps, big productions. All of my encounters, my, my experiences and my ideas, my values were shaped in those sort of environments. So I had that thought or impression that, hey, this is how we do ministry. You either go big or go home. We either have it all or we have nothing at all. I just had the idea. So I came into my recent church. The youth ministry was going through a transition. So I took over as the youth pastor. And you know, it was tough going for a while, but after that, man, did it explode. Like really, it was a I genuinely believe it was a move of God. We did incredible things throughout the years. To no credit to just to myself whatsoever, credit to the team, the people that I serve with, and of course to the one and only Lord Jesus Christ. It grew to the largest it had ever been in the church's 26 years history. We multiplied services. We went from one youth service to two youth services unheard of. We even started a conference called Generation Now, which ran for about four years uh, until COVID hit. That conference was also a step of faith. You know, at a point of time, throughout those conferences, just the atmosphere was incredible. It was soaked with passion, with hunger for God. You must understand, I was riding all of these highs, you know, like the youth ministry was doing well. The conference was having a lot of influence. People were talking about what we were doing, praising us, criticizing us, all these different things. But lives were getting changed, I can assure you. Uh, people were getting touched and yeah, a lot of great things was happening. And even myself as a minister, I was on an upward trajectory or progress. I went on from youth pastor, then I took on the worship ministry, joined the senior executive team in the church. So in a lot of ways, it looked like my path was set. My journey was marked out ahead for me. Like it was predictable where I was heading. Everybody who was looking, it looked like I was on the right track and the right path. But you know, along the way, I've had questions and I've kept most of these questions to myself because I find that honestly, sometimes when you're in a big environment, uh, you don't have time for questions. You just keep going. There's no time to address this or address that. You just got to keep going, keep going. So for many years, I wrestled with different questions, you know. So like while I saw big results, impact, like numbers coming and all that, but I was also very conscious of the fact that events was producing a lot of participants or spectators, in fact, but were they actually producing disciples? So these were little questions that, that came along the way. And then, of course, COVID-19 hit. In 2020, we actually started a new college and university ministry. And all of that was like almost in one stroke wiped out, so to speak. The conference was abolished, youth services completely online, streamlined to one, and we ran the college and university ministry online for about two years. Even That's another story to tell, but basically everything that we knew and that we were familiar with all came to a stop. Now, for many people, they probably saw that as a point of frustration. If I were to be honest, I was a lot more relieved 
because I felt like I was going at such a pace, going harder, going faster all the time that I just never, didn't really have the time to stop and to reflect. And COVID-19 really gave me the opportunity to do that, to really seek God and start now looking at the questions that I pose to myself more seriously. So some of the thoughts that I've had is this, you know, like that I was so involved and so busy with church programs that literally most of my waking hours was in church. And the amount of non-Christians that I knew just became smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. I could even at one point count how many non-Christians I would know with both hands. That's, that's how saturated I was in the whole church environment. The other thing that really got me thinking was that the things that we celebrate or the things that we value and measure success in the church it's not found in the Bible. If Jesus were to be walking on earth today, I feel like for the most part, we won't invite him to speak at our conferences. Really, why do I say that? Because if you think about who do we invite to speak at our conferences, we invite the most charismatic, the best dressed, the most stage presence, and how big their ministry is, how much influence they have. If I think about Jesus, he only had 12. And when I think about that, you know, we celebrate and we push for numbers, more views and all that. And I go, is that even in the Bible? I I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not saying that that is not important. But what I'm saying is that maybe somehow along the way, we've kind of gotten things mixed up. So these were questions that I honestly posed to myself. You know, I had this thought that literally every person will spend most of their waking hours at work or you'll be with your family. At best, you will spend two or three days, if you're super committed, maybe four in church. But yet, in a lot of our church syllabus or programs, we are more focused on equipping people to run church programs than we are actually empowering them to live the gospel out in their daily lives. And to me, that was an issue because why should I have more trainings to teach people to be cell leaders, to be worship leaders, to be ushers and all that? You know, again, I'm not saying all those are wrong, but I'm, I'm, why, do, why do we have that? But we don't have enough conversations or sessions where we would challenge and encourage people to have a bigger vision for their workplace. Can you imagine this for a moment? If 50% of Christians out there because I am fairly confident that the majority of Christians are not full-time church workers. I'm sure you guys are out there in accounting, design, finance, computing, automotive, engineering, science, you name it. If all of those people, 50% of them at least, had a bigger vision for their workplace, that they would have the heart that you know, work is for worship. It's not just a means of wealth, but it is a manifestation of our worship. Go to work to be an influence, to make a positive impact. If more and more people had that, if we had more impact at home, if we raise our kids, if we influence our spouse with the values of the gospel, rather than just relying on church, Sunday school on the weekend, if more and more people caught that, how much more different do you think the world would be? But as it is, in my experience and in my humble opinion, many people are content to just go with the flow, go to church on Sunday and the weekend, keep all their spiritual things on the weekend, and then on the weekday, they get up and they just go through the daily grind and routine again. And to me, Spirituality, Christianity is not a ritual or routine, it's a revelation. We don't just go to church, we are meant to be the church. And I had all these thoughts and all these desires and I can tell you I was sitting in meetings and we we're arguing about how do we increase our production, get more volunteers, make our program more attractive. How do we do all of this? So I spent hours and hours in operation, content, meetings and all that. And I go, at the end of the day, I just can't deal with this because there was something tugging at my heart, something more, a greater longing, and I just felt I could not do this, honestly. Um, so that's when I had to make a very difficult decision that, you know what, maybe God is calling me to move on to something else. And you must understand, at the point of where I was, it was 13 years in the making. I was where I had thought I would be ever since I got into Bible college. Pastoring in a big church, 
influential ministry, uh, in a senior leadership position, everything seemed to be okay and I believe everything would have been all right if I just stayed the course. But let me tell you, why did the Holy Spirit in His grace and wisdom as well as glory provide a course correction. I was impacted by Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus said that in the last days, many will come to me saying, Lord, we healed the sick for you. We did this for you. We did that for you. Are you pleased? But the Lord said, be gone from me, you wicked and evil people. I know none of you. So I was, convic I was convicted because I didn't want to reach a point in my life where at the end of the day, I would tell God, God, look at the great programs I ran for you. Look at the great holy huddles I had for you. Look at all the nice events and all these nice things that I had for you. Aren't you pleased? And I do not want to hear the Lord say, did I ask for any of this? So I made a difficult decision. You know what? I'm going to step out of full-time ministry in the church that I was in because I just could not in good conscience carry on after all that was happening in me internally. And what was next for me then? Well, I had this thought that like, God, I don't just want to preach it. I want to be able to live it. For about 10 years, I was trying to bring more people to church, but I felt like at this point of my life, I now want to bring God into the world. So that's where I thought, I'm going to get a job and I am going to also start a different alternative faith community. One that would be focused on these things. One that will not be chasing the programs or the events, but one that will just go back to the roots of discipleship. I've had conversations with people and you know, people ask me questions uh, like, hey, I thought you, you were called. Why are you abandoning your calling? I thought being a pastor is a calling. This is where even my understanding of calling has evolved. We think that a calling is for people to go into the pastorate or to go into ministry. But the truth of the matter is all of us are called. I mean, what does 1 Peter 2 verse 9 tell us? We are all a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a people called to proclaim the goodness of God. All of us are that. All of us are called. So I don't actually see myself abandoning my calling. I actually see myself stepping into the next level of my calling because if I want to go back to that memory and God said, I will use you for my purposes. Man, God doesn't just want to use people in church. God wants to use people through the church to impact the world, not just in church. And there should not be this sacred and circular divide. Because again, at the end of the day, it's work is worship. Just because somebody works in church, it does not make what they do more important or holier than what someone does outside because it's both coming together and it's again us not going to church but us being the church. And I just felt like there was a reset, you know, going through and there was like a reorientation. It's not been easy because I have to actually will myself to think differently, to be different. But essentially, that is where I'm at today. And that is why I stepped out of the role that I had. Could I have remained there? Absolutely. But I just felt that, man, even post COVID-19, the world has changed. Things are different. Let's not try to bring people back to church. Let's move people forward into the kingdom of God and to what God wants to do. And God is not done yet because COVID-19, well, if God was done, COVID-19 would have just ended the human race and the church right there and then, yeah? But I feel like God still has something bigger for each and every one of us. But the answer will not be in the four walls of the church. It will be the kingdom outside. And I'm not, again, minimizing what the church is about. I'm not demonizing it either, but I'm saying as Christians, as believers, let's have a greater vision for the, for the work of God. Um, I didn't want to spend more time creating more complex ecosystems for people to be in, in the church because, man, we are sent to the world. We are, we, we are sent to be messengers, to be ambassadors, 
We should be a witness. The Bible says if you have a light, you don't put a lamp or a cup over it. If you have a light, you shine it. So friends, brothers and sisters, that is what I am here to tell you, that you can serve God in church, but you can also serve God outside at your work and in your house. So if you have watched this far, first of all, I want to say, Thank you for listening to what I have to say. But if you are in any way in a similar position or sort of a similar position to where I am, I want to encourage you, be bold, trust God. You know, when I wanted to step out of full-time ministry, I was thinking to myself, what in the world am I going to do? Because all I have on my resume is church work. In fact, People have said that to me, is that who's gonna employ you? You've been, what skills do you have? You, you only work in church. But let me tell you, where God guides, He provides. If God leads you to it, He will see you through it. And I had the opportunity to get a job uh, with a friend of mine, you know, who's, who's gonna, who's, who has a, who has, who's running a tech company. I have zero background in tech. Let me tell you, Friends, if you have been serving in church and if you've led a bunch of volunteers to do uh, certain things, you have skills, you have leadership. Don't doubt yourself because those things are valuable. It takes something extraordinary to lead a bunch of people who are not being paid. So don't discount what God has put in you. And be bold, be, be brave. You, you'll trust God to have a way, uh, to make a way rather, and um, yeah, it, or if you, you know, if you've just been thinking about like, um, yeah, you know, church is this, church is that, and all that kind of stuff, and you've got questions, uh, I would love to carry on this conversation if we could. You know, this video obviously will not be able to address in greater detail some of the things that you are wondering and all that, but hey, you know, if you feel like it, send me a message, drop a comment, DM me, and uh, I'll try to respond in the best way that I can. Um, but what's next for me, as I mentioned, yeah, I, I'm going to be starting uh, my new job. Pray for me. Um, totally going to be super green um, in that area, but I'm going to trust God that you know, greater stories will come out of that. Uh, I, have a lot, I have lots of ministry stories and, uh, that I can share and I can testify. I am believing for more stories, but this time in the workplace to see God move uh, through me. Um, but I'm also studying a, started a, uh, a little fellowship church thingy. You know, you can look it up uh, on, my, on my Instagram or on my personal profile if you want to see what's that about. If you just want to come along or tag along on this journey, have more of this conversation, you're welcome to do that as well. But otherwise, thanks for listening. And I am believing that whatever God has placed in your heart, go for it. The time is now. Take risk. Be courageous. The world is not getting any better. But take heart because Jesus himself said in John 16 verse 33, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. And, the Rome, and Romans tells us that we are more than overcomers. So my friends, let's overcome together and really see what God wants to do next. I believe, honestly, I sincerely believe that revival is and can come, but it is not going to be by us filling stadiums or venues, even though there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But it's going to be more and more of us Christians and believers and followers of Jesus having a revelation a greater vision for the workplace and a greater heart and love for people and not just programs. Thanks for listening. God bless you. Catch you next time.